Hi, I am Max Strang, founding principal of Strang Design, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome back to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Architect Maria Ludwig Michael Mies changed his name. He added his mother's maiden name, Roja, and the Dutch Vander to become... Drum roll, please. (laughs) Mies van der Roja. Most of his fans just refer to him as Mies, you know, like Moby or Beyonce. He's still one of the most famous architects in the world some 50 years after his death. Today, we're going to talk about his greatest house, the Farnsworth House, with Alex Beam. He's the author of the new book, Broken Glass, Mies van der Roja, Edith Farnsworth, and the Fight Over a Modernist Masterpiece. And we'll also be chatting with Scott Mahaffey. He's executive director of the Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois, which you can visit. Later on, a few minutes with Frank Harmon reading from his book, Native Places. And now, the guy considering changing his own name. Really? Yes, Here's your host, George Smart. Thanks, Tom. I did give it some thought, but there's really nowhere to go with this. (laughs) G-Man? G-O? No. Seriously, no. No. And and really, does a, a name change going solo cause fame or vice versa? Still... You know you've made it in popular culture when you're referenced by just one name. Bono, Cher, Sting, Oprah, Twiggy, Liberace, Bjork, Charo, Enya, Halston, Pink, Teller, Fabio, Prince, Seal, Adele. Only Mies reached this level in architecture. Even Frank Lloyd Wright was always Frank Lloyd Wright. (laughs) Everybody else has two names or is referenced by their last. Johnson, Alto, Lautner, Elwood, Schindler. Zaha came close to being just one name before she died. And my money's on Bjarke Ingalls to pull it off next. For now, though, Mies is still the king of the one-named architects. So before we get into the show, please join me in a toast to the three Fs of residential design. Okay. Here's a toast to Falling Water, Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece in Mill Run, Pennsylvania. The Farnsworth House. Mies van der Rohe's masterpiece in Plano, Illinois, and Flintstone, Fred's <laughs> masterpiece in Bedrock, which I bet you didn't know is located in Cobblestone County, just down the road from Granite Town. We thought that last one was only on TV, uh-huh. but in fact, there's actually a named Flintstone house designed by architect William Nicholson in 1976 in Hillsborough, California. Using what was then an experimental technique, The domed buildings were made by spraying shotcrete on steel rebar and then using inflated weather balloons, according to Wikipedia. Shotcrete. I've never heard of that. Yeah, you shoot it. I guess so. Shoot concrete, yeah. The complex has approximately 2,700 square feet, including one bedroom accessed by a spiral staircase. All the interior services are rounded, and the master bathroom has a floor of rocks instead of tiles. (laughs) The neighbors have been no surprise, unhappy for decades. <laughs> and the house was so hated, it inspired administrative pitchforks and torches, the formation of an architectural review board. A new owner, Florence Fang, and I'm not making that up, really? came on board a few years ago and really spruced the place up, adding dinosaurs and a huge yabba dabba do sign in rocks, which last year nudged those neighbors into getting the city to sue the property for public nuisance. This is unsettled as far as we know. Our guest today would love to launch a lawsuit against a certain river, the Fox River, which becomes a nuisance and floods the Farnsworth house every few years. Mm. The good news is there's a solution coming, which we'll learn more about shortly. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. In our continuing world of make-believe, Angela Roll was a spy for the deep architectural state making sure the great modernist architecture was not wiped out by devout classicists pining for an earlier time, like the 1800s. 
Codenamed The Broker, accompanied by her financier boyfriend at the time, codenamed Zero Interest, they were called on to restore the terrazzo floors in Saarinen's TWA building. Traveling from the AIA headquarters in Washington to Austin, Minnesota, they stole the secret formula for Spam, Yum. which coincidentally makes for an excellent floor wax or a dessert topping. On the flight back to Washington, Zero Interest flirted shamelessly with a woman named Jennifer, ah. who was breaking up with a guy named Brad, oh. who had just taken up with a woman named Angelina. Mm. By the time the plane landed, Angela told Zero Interest to hit the road, and two days later accepted a proposal from international hospital executive Eric whose love for her was long a pre-existing condition. Aww. Today, she continues to defend modernism, dealing with unreasonable sellers, unrealistic buyers, incompetent builders, and bureaucratic city councils. Plus, she's got some spam recipes that are surprisingly delicious. As she says, if you haven't fried it, you haven't tried it. Reach modernist realtor Angela Roll at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. Mies was born in 1886, and by 1907, without any formal architectural training, he built his first house as an independent architect. His Barcelona Pavilion in 1929 and the Villa Tugendhat, completed in 1930, catapulted him to worldwide fame, and he joined the Bauhaus as their director of architecture. He pursued a modern, unadorned architectural language that was copied all over the world and ushered in a new era of technology and production. He left Germany in 1937 for a job heading the Department of Architecture at the new Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, and he designed many buildings on the campus, including Crown Hall, containing the School of Architecture. His many significant U.S. projects include the residential towers on Lakeshore Drive, the Chicago Federal Center Complex, and the Seagram Building in New York. Along with Walter Gropius and Le Corbusier, he is regarded as one of the great masters of modern architecture. He is famous for the sayings, less is more, and God is in the details. We've had his grandson on the show, architect Dirk Lohan, who you can access in our back archives, and a little-known story from the show. Meese visited Raleigh, North Carolina during construction of Dorton Arena during the 1950s and was presumed dead. We'll talk about that. And let's not forget the Barcelona chair still rocking the showrooms and bedrooms and living rooms of modernists young and old. Our first guest is Alex Beam. He grew up as the son of a diplomat, and he attended Phillips Exeter Academy, where he was foreign correspondent mm, for the twice-weekly school newspaper. So we assume he reported from Boston, and he also went on to graduate from another foreign locale. Yale University in my city of my birth, New yes. Haven, Connecticut. He wrote for 30 years for the Business Week, the Boston Globe, and Vanity Fair, among other publications, on a variety of subjects, including squash. Not sure whether that was the vegetable or the sport, but Alex is the author of Gracefully Insane, Life and Death Inside America's Premier Mental Hospital, a Great Idea at the Time, The Rise, Fall, and Curious Afterlife of the Great Books, and American Crucifixion, The Murder of Joseph Smith and the Fate of the Mormon Church, among other books. His latest is Broken Glass, Mies van der Rohe, Edith Farnsworth, and the Fight Over a Modernist Masterpiece. Welcome, Alex. <laughs> Thank you, George. What an incredible introduction everything I've been trying to cover up in my long, long life. Jeez. Sorry. <laughs> Scott Mahaffey is a landscape architect and a fellow in the American Society of Landscape Architects. He teaches courses in modernism at the Illinois Institute of Technology's College of Architecture. And in 2018, he became the Farnsworth House Executive Director. This is a must-see house for modernism fans. After Edith Farnsworth, it was owned by past podcast guest Lord Palumbo. And since 2003, it's been in the fine care of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Other modernist sites owned by the National Trust include Philip Johnson's Glass House in New Canaan, Connecticut, the Marcel Breuer House in Pocantinko Hills, New York, Pocantinko, Pocantinko yes. Hills, and Frank Lloyd Wright's Pope Leahy House in Alexandria, Virginia. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. So, Scott, let's start off with you. Describe a little bit about Mises' impact on modern architecture. Please limit it to 60 seconds. <laughs> 
Well, but we can't really do that in 60 I'm seconds. I'm just kidding. But uh, certainly, you know, he was his impact was felt uh, in Europe before he came to the United States and then across the United States. I think, you know, timing is everything, right? So uh, all of the uh, young GIs who come back from the war and want to become architects, you know, enroll at IIT, they've got uh, the GI Bill behind them. And despite the fact that he was a German, they fell in love with him. So he uh, had a lot of devotees, and um, the Farnsworth House was sort of a touchstone for their uh, many of these young architects. And uh, they went on to create their own versions at later points in their careers. We had one of his students, Milton Small, come back to North Mm. Carolina and create a number of great buildings, sadly about half of which had been destroyed. Who were some of the other students of Mies that went on to great things? Well, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. (laughs) The folks at IIT would certainly know the best, but Myron Goldsmith was the project architect on the Farnsworth House, and uh, there were several others who worked in Mises' office at that time or were students or graduate students of Mies, and uh, all of them, you know, worked on the Farnsworth House, including Alfred Caldwell, who was a landscape architect, but also taught classes in architecture at IIT. He did drafting for one summer on the Farnsworth House drawings. IIT was really the, the place to be for a long time. You had Laszlo maholy Naj on campus and Mies designing all these buildings. I mean, what a fantastic environment for design. Wasn't Naj at the Institute of Design, and they didn't merge, or am I wrong about that? Well, at first they were separated, and then, of course, the Institute of Design was sort of forced into the basement of Crown Hall. So (laughs) um, Uh, there there was always some friction, of course, between Mies van der Rohe and Laszlo Maholy Naj. So I think that uh, there were a number of people in Chicago who appreciated the fact that we had both of them. Both were stellar at the time. What an incredible opportunity to be a student, though, in Crown Hall, seeing all this talent and learning from them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a beautiful setting. And to be on Mises' campus, especially at the time, certainly uh, through the age of postmodernism, IIT took it on the chin, if you will, and uh, wasn't a favored campus. But I think with the rebirth of, you know, urbanism, new urbanism, an interest in mid-century modernism and Mises, um, it's really rebounded. And the buildings are, you know, being restored or renovated, and the campus has been re-landscaped based on Alfred Caldwell's original design. So it's a, it's a lovely campus now. It's such a beautiful campus to walk through, too, mm-hmm. just from one place to the other. And the, the train line runs through it? The right. elevated train. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, the right. subway, right. There's a beautiful yeah. metro stop that was redesigned a number of years ago, I think by Rim Koolhaas. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, the McCormick uh, Tribune Center. And, of course, it's on bus lines. And then there is a metro line on the west side of the campus. So it's easy to get to from downtown and from most of the suburbs. And when there's not a pandemic, the the campus does a wonderful tour that will take you all around. You can have a general tour or you can have something specific to architecture. And it's something everybody should try to work into their schedule. That's right. And Chicago Architecture Center often offers a Mies Plus tour, which includes IIT campus and the Farnsworth House and at least one of the Lakeshore Drive buildings. And, of course, Chicago Architecture Center is now housed in a Mies van der Rohe building in Chicago, right on Wacker Drive, right on the river. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, at Illinois Center. It was one of Mies' last projects, and um, I think the project might have been seen to fruition by Fujikawa Johnson but um, or one of the Mies successor firms. There were a handful of them, but uh, he was definitely involved with the initial design. So I want to share our North Carolina story about Mies. When he visited Raleigh, North Carolina during the construction of Dorton Arena, which is a giant hyperbolic paraboloid concrete building, he went to talk to the design students at NC State. And, of course, they did what they did best. They invited him afterwards to the second-story walk-up apartment of one of the students where they proceeded to get Mies drunk. Very, (laughs) very, very drunk. And then as Mies was leaving, he fell down the stairs, a long series of stairs all the way to the bottom. He was a big man, and he got to the bottom in a crumpled heap, and the students thought they had killed him because he didn't move. Evidently, for quite a while. And then slowly, the sleeping bear woke up 
and kind of waddled his way down the sidewalk, and that was it. But they felt good that Raleigh was not the site yes. of his demise. <laughs> yes. An unfortunate drinking architecture incident. Um, Alex, before we ask about your book, what was your Vanity Fair blog on squash? Were you hungry or athletic? <laughs> it, was, it was actually a very early blog about the sport. The uh, The former editor of Vanity Fair felt he, he started four blogs at the same time, and he felt that um, – the sport squash would appeal to an astonishing demographic. And there was even sort of an occasional <laughs> architecture angle. Um, for instance, the Federal Reserve Building in Boston, which is, of all things, a classic example of a modernist skyscraper, has two squash courts on like the 12th floor. But so mm. for mm. a few years, at least, I wrote, yes, I wrote about um, basically rich white people playing an intense game. But there is a Tom Wolf angle, so so don't despair. Oh. Yes, tell us. Well, Tom, I mean, I met Tom Wolf because his son uh, played for the nationally ranked uh, Trinity College team, and when I approached him at the um, at the famous Trinity Harvard squash match, I introduced myself, and he said, "Ah, Mr. Beam, the Boston Globe squash correspondent. I know your work well." Oh, <laughs> isn't that great? Wow, that's right. on your resume. Sorry, I had to tell that story. Yeah. No, you know, when you can be a big fish in a very small squash court, that's a good <laughs> that's a good thing. Exactly. Now, one more little bit of your history I have to ask about, Alex, and this goes way back. Can you tell us a political joke of Leningrad? Oh, of course I can tell you a political joke of Leningrad. Another one of those. <laughs> yes. I can tell you 500 political jokes of Leningrad. <laughs> Yeah, I thought you were going to ask me about my my trip to Brno at age 12, but let's pass through that. <laughs> okay. um, yes, the first time I wrote for Big Money, I wrote an introduction to a book called The Political Jokes of Leningrad, which which are the same political jokes um, all over the then Soviet Union. I'll try to pick the, the one that has the most bang for the buck. It's very, very famous. <laughs> so uh, Lenny Brezhnev, the then leader of the USSR, is, mm-hmm. is um, about to die. And he's given a tour of hell because he's obviously going to go to hell. (laughs) And he visits hell and he sees Vladimir Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, bleeping or let's say having sexual intercourse with Marilyn Monroe. And Brezhnev says to the person showing, this is fantastic. Is this what hell is about? I get to have sex with Marilyn Monroe. And of course, the comeback is, no, Mr. Brezhnev, that's hell for Marilyn Monroe. Oh, George, this is terrible. I want to have a boring discussion about architecture. I'm so sorry to disappoint you, Alex. Oh, God, I'm crestfallen. (laughs) Now, Alex, how did you discover the Farnsworth house and this story with Meese and Edith? Well, I'm obviously a a writer of eclectic pursuits, as you've convinced even me. Um, I had started doing some writing about architecture, partly because, I, as I once told you, I visited Sarasota. I'd gotten to know the early Paul Rudolph work. And um, I actually just asked a really intelligent woman who edited the Architecture Boston magazine. I said, you know, I don't feel there's that many books about architecture, at least books for the general reader that would be fun to read is, what would you recommend? I'd like to have a, a masterpiece at the center of the book. And I like to have a paper trail in both directions leading to the architect and to the client. And um, she mentioned Boston City Hall, which I have zero interest in, but although it gets written about quite a bit where I live. And out of the blue, I mean, she mentioned the Farnsworth House, and I mean, which I had, I had never heard of, and I'm not even 100% sure. I guess everyone in, in the biz knows about the famous lawsuit between uh, Meese and Edith Farnsworth. I don't know if she knew that this kind of 4,000-page transcript had surfaced in the previous few years. It, it's not exactly like they sent out a press release. So for somebody looking to write the kind of book I wanted to write with with a lot of information about the decisions and the personalities, um, that was sort of a game-changer. Journalists really like court transcripts because, of, well, partly because they're libel-proof. You know, you can reproduce right. anything from a court transcript. And also, I mean, I know this is going to sound painfully naive, but a lot of people don't lie <laughs> during de- deposition or under oath. <laughs> yeah, so, um, just on TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. 
So it's a desirable source, and 4,000 pages is, you know, a heck of a lot of pages. I'm not saying the whole book is written off that transcript, but it was a, a real allurement to moving into the project. Scott, Edith Farnsworth was the, the client for this project, obviously. Tell us a little bit about her. She's been rediscovered quite a bit in the last few years. Right. Yeah. No, Alice Friedman really, several years ago, wrote a book that brought new light, shed new light on Edith. And Alice, I assume that her writing was somewhat helpful to you in your pursuit. Yeah, um, I did talk to her and she was terrific. Yeah, definitely. Go on. Yeah. No, and then recently, uh, in recent years, Nora Wendell, who's a professor of architecture at University of New Mexico, has written quite a bit about Edith using her archives, using her papers, which are at the Newberry Library and I'm in Chicago, and I'm sure those were helpful to you as well, Alex. Indeed. What did Edith Farnsworth do for a living? Well, she was a research physician. She was started to be a classical musician and went to Rome to study with Mario Corti, who was one of the foremost classical violinists in Italy at the time. And she was there for several years, I think maybe even six years at the conservatorio. And I then think, she. I think fewer, although I, mean, I know sometimes people get into wrestling matches, but I, I think two or three, frankly. Okay. Well, and then she withdrew and traveled on her own through Europe for a while. I and think. when was this? Late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. Okay. Pretty early on. Exactly. And then she uh, came back to the United States, and on the ship back to the United States, she met one of the leading research physicians in the world from Sweden who convinced her that she should become a research physician. So she applies to Northwestern um, University College of Medicine. She's one of uh, four women who were accepted at, at that time. And uh, kind of completes, you know, her uh, training uh, (laughs) very quickly. I mean, when you look at what physicians go through now. And um, she was an internist at Passive and Hospital, which is associated with Northwestern. And Alice can shed more light on this. But she very early, as a young doctor, became a research physician because family connections, family money helped set up her research lab. She um, developed an interest in Bright's disease along with other uh, Chicago area physicians almost, who were almost exclusively white men, one of whom later won a Nobel Prize, a guy from the Mayo mm-hmm. Clinic in Minnesota. In any case, um, she was practicing a kind of medicine that later came to be called nephrology. It was a study study of the kidney, and sh- her specialty was a specific artificial hormone and the cure of this disease that basically people our age haven't heard of because it was wiped out in the 50s. What was it called? Bright's disease. Bright's disease, yeah. Mm. It was like polio. It got wiped out, although it's coming back a little bit now, the polio part is, unfortunately. I know. I was just going to say that uh, ACTH, which was the hormone compound that she was working with, was really enzymatic research, and um, it was based on um, dehydrated hog pituitaries <laughs> that the armor packing plant in Chicago <laughs> set aside for her. So, um you know, I wonder if that's in spam. No, I'm just kidding, spam. <laughs> well, not at that time. They were saving them all for Dr. Farnsworth. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> but, and Alice, correct me if I'm wrong, I, the fellow from Mayo, whose research won a Nobel Prize, he was certainly aware of Dr. Farnsworth's research, if not even built upon it. Is that true? You just got me here. You know, I'm too much of an old-fashioned reporter. Um, you know, Edith, as you and I both know, had uh, eight citations in the literature, all of them shared. She was relatively rarely a lead researcher. I feel like this is something that people of goodwill might disagree. You know, as you know, her her acolytes in Italy, where, where she had some real acolytes because of her amazing translation work, sort of created a story that she was cut out of the Nobel Prize, which I don't think is true. I did, you know, engage the historian for the American Society of Nephrology to help me, and he's quoted in my book. I feel like I don't know the direct answer to that question. Well, let's fast forward to how does she meet Mies, and how does she decide that this is going to be the architect of her very unusual house? I mean, it's unusual today if it was built, but back then it was quite unusual, and I hope that if you're not driving or on the treadmill, that she'll Google it now so you can get a sense of what we're talking about. How did she meet Mies? I mean, it's kind 
kind of a set piece. It, it starts my book. Uh, you know, she met him at a what feels like a cozy dinner party in the Gold Coast with four or five people in attendance, depending on who's counting, in a posh apartment that belonged to a gallery owner. And basically, as the story goes, she's um, having a wonderful dinner. Meese is quite taciturn. His um, The year's 1945. And Scott's also welcome to pitch in and disagree with me. I mean, his his English, comma, never strong, you know, wasn't really flourishing in 1945. And in any case, they were seated next to each other after dinner, and she had just bought nine acres from Colonel McCormick out by the Fox River in Plano, Illinois. I mean, and again, we're talking about a very kind of esoteric stratum of Chicago society. And she knew Meese was an architect, although that's about all she knew. And she said, you know, would you design a house for me? And um, the house that they, of course, were talking about would become the Farnsworth house. And, I mean, Scott can definitely speak to where that design came from. I, I, in my opinion, in a way, the client became somewhat transparent in this transaction, I think. And he ended up building a house that I think might have existed in his head. But I'd be curious to hear what Scott thinks. No, I agree. If you look at uh, sketches of, of uh, Mises' earlier work, there are various you know, versions of the Farnsworth House, including the Rezor House, which was never built, but certainly similar to Farnsworth House. And it seemed to be explorations on a theme because a number of his uh, commissions around the same time or shortly thereafter all look like versions of the Farnsworth House. Hmm. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us, they weren't realized. But it's interesting that initially Edith had commissioned uh, Keck and Keck, very well-known Chicago oh, sure, and yeah. modernist, to design her weekend house. And my understanding, and there's very little in the Keck and Keck archives, but my understanding is they basically said, you know, we're all business. This is the way we make our living. And once you sign off on the design program, you know, you live with what we give you. And she had never built anything before and was sort of late in life coming to design and appreciation for design. So she wanted to be more involved, more engaged in the process. And certainly she was over the next seven years. Well, the the lawsuit, which was four thousand pages, and and four thousand pages is is a box of paper, right? I mean, it's it's a huge <laughs> amount of paper. That's reams. Yeah, reams and reams of paper. It's like eleven cartons, I think, which I hauled on a dolly into downtown Chicago to get them digitized. Oh, oh, wow! So you know? Yeah, you you know the story. <laughs> I have firsthand knowledge of this paper. <laughs> I assume that that there were some some disagreements between client and architect on many levels to warrant four thousand pages. What went wrong? Well, that's really two questions. Um, why don't I handle the second question about the lawsuit? And Scott, why don't you you want to talk? Because there were not really too many disagreements during the construction project. Okay. Well, no. I mean, it was a design-build project, which is interesting for people that Mies became the general contractor, or his office did. And I think Alice is right that at some point in the design process, which kind of dragged on for various reasons, um, and some have speculated that Edith wanted the process to drag on um, as a design process sort of neared the end. I think there was Edith may have wanted to get the house finished, may have wanted to get Meese out of her hair. Certainly she was irritated that the project estimates kept going over budget. So she cut out the screened porch and she cut out the wardrobe just to kind of get things done. And then, of course, hired a different architect to finish those parts of the project. But Alex will probably tell you more about that. Yeah, I mean, because I was, of course, for storytelling purposes, it would have been better if there were more clashes during construction, but there there really weren't. I mean, the the lawsuit is almost a separate issue. I I, I it's it's a lot like a divorce suit. It's a, you know, and um, it's based on uh, allegations of how poorly the house was able to be lived in after the construction. It filled up with rainwater, uh, you know, shortly after she occupied it. There were a lot of heating and cooling problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But those weren't really disagreements uh, while they were discussing the design of the house. Well, what happened after it was over? What were their main points of contention post-construction? Well, Scott certainly correctly mentioned money. I mean, one underlying thing that that is detailed at some length in my book is that they were just tremendously 
warm friends, you know, for, for a few years, and then they stopped being warm friends. So everything kind of went to heck. So suddenly when a you know, new bill has $5,000 more on it, it's perceived as a gesture of hostility. So you had money, you had roof problems, you had goopy oil residue streaming down the glass, you had the two boiler problem, which was a design problem. You had a lot of kind of serious allegations of lack of mechanical engineering chops on the part of Mies van der Rohe, which are on the one hand sort of understandable, but on the other hand were, were quite irksome and didn't play very well in court. You said that this was a design-build project, right? Yes. It ended up being. I think Mies okay. put it out to several contractors and couldn't find someone and took it on himself. Do you know if he had ever done one of these before? Well, of course, in Europe, architects are often, you know, more involved in the construction process. So he may have been accustomed to working that way, which became unusual for, you know, the U.S. But, you know, maybe even up into the 40s or 50s was still much more commonplace than it is today. Alex, there were counterclaims in this suit, too, right? Because Mies wanted to get paid and he wasn't getting paid. Right. The suit is easily misunderstood because it feels like Edith is the aggrieved party and the complainant. But in fact, Mies filed the suit to get money, to basically to get $14,000 that that he felt was owed him, in a sense, legitimately. You and Scott are talking about some, I mean, some issues that, that are complicated for the layperson. But for instance, there was no architect's fee ever paid. And there was a debate during the trial as to whether Mies might be entitled to a contractor's fee. So there was there was a lot of money sort of gone missing. So Mies was actually just trying to assert the the veracity of his claim that he was owed about fourteen thousand dollars. And how did that suit turn out? It's a total mess, <laughs> like everything. <laughs> I mean, like life itself. It was a suit before a so-called master in chancery. You know, it was not held in front of a jury. Um, it had to be approved by a judge. I don't know. One judge went to sleep for a few years, and basically <laughs> nothing ever happened except that Mies was getting a lot of bad publicity. And so it, it, it kind of after a few years, he sent someone over to Edith, and they, they settled for about 1200 bucks. He had originally wanted 14000 That was the— de- Right. So to clarify, you know, there was no design contract, no written agreement between the client and the architect, which was probably, you know, Mises' first and foremost mistake. But he filed a lien, a contractor's lien on the house. And that, of course, irritated and concerned Dr. Farnsworth. She lost the first settlement, but instantly um, appealed. And then there was, as Alex said, a countersuit, and that dragged on for quite a while. And then eventually, yeah, they settled out of court for a negligible sum. This all sounds like a great movie plot, and understand that is. There's been a script in production for several cast changes for years. What's happening with that? Yeah, no, it's still we're still very optimistic that it's going to happen. Now Elizabeth Debicki is... Uh, supposed to play Edith. It was Maggie Gyllenhaal. And uh, Ray Fiennes is supposed to uh, be Miss Van der Rohe. And uh, they were supposed to start to, uh, production this year. But of course, COVID shut down all uh, international travel. And um, a lot of the production company is coming from Canada. So it's on hold until next year. Uh, knock on wood, it happens, you know, next year. So, Besides visiting the house, You also sponsor a number of exhibitions there. I know there's been one recently by Robin Hill called Side by Side. Can you tell us about that one? Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. So right now, of course, the Farnsworth House is refurnished as it appeared in 1955. So we have reused historic photographs to refurnish the house as Edith actually lived in it. And typically it's presented as uh, the home's second owner, Peter Palumbo, furnished it from 72 to 74 with Mies Furniture and a few pieces by Dirk Lohan, Mises' grandson. But uh, this year and next year, it's furnished as Dr. Farnsworth actually had it with Scandinavian modern and Italian modern furniture, uh, most of which was purchased from the Baldwin Kingry showroom in Chicago, which is a forerunner to Crate and Barrel. And uh, then, of course, we have companion exhibitions that complement the theme of our current focus and Robin Hill's exhibition, current exhibition, Side by Side, focuses on the Farnsworth House and Philip Johnson Glass House. 
And it's really remarkable in its simplicity, the side-by-side comparisons and photo diptychs. He has no, you know, labels or cards to explain. He leaves that up to the viewer, and uh, it's very striking. Now, I apologize for asking this random question, but do either of you know where the expression, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, came from? Was it either of these homes? But I don't. I, I don't. I don't have a computer in front <laughs> they didn't of me. Didn't have glass houses back then. They were like the Flintstone house. Wasn't yeah. it? Oh, that's right. That's right. The Flintstone house. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know I if Adam and be. Eve had like a nice A-frame up in the hills. <laughs> I've been wrong before. It's uh, really uh, important, I think, that people who have seen the Farnsworth house before, and you know have an idea in their head that this is how it really was. And it wasn't, of course. Lord Palumbo, the second owner, felt uh, that it should be furnished with me furniture as it was originally intended and got rid of the Barnesworth furnishings that she had left in the house when he took possession. And those his first furniture is really what people are accustomed to seeing, but it's not real. It's, it's not how she actually lived. Well, let's talk about the antagonist in this drama, and that is the Fox River which comes along and floods this place from time to time in in various levels of disarray. If you're looking at the photos on Google, you'll see that there are a series of platforms outside that that work your way up to the main level of the house. How high does the water come, Scott? Well, on an average year, it doesn't get any higher than maybe 12 inches. This year, it was about 36 inches. Well, no, maybe more than that, closer to uh, 48 inches deep. But it just lasted a few days. So as far as we know, the house has been penetrated with water um, about seven times in seven decades. The last was in 2012 when the floor slab was sitting in water uh, underneath. Um, And so the water was penetrating the precast and the steel and the wiring and the, you know, radiant heat system, which was doing just as much damage as though the house had been flooded, you know. So... It's a real problem. (laughs) But I understand there is a great new technical solution on the horizon. What is that? Yeah, knock on wood again. So (laughs) the National Trust, and this is all on our website, worked with a lot of architects, architectural historians, people throughout uh, Chicago and the United States to look at several possible solutions, uh, some of which, of course, uh, involved um, moving the house entirely from its historic site. But uh, we all feel, I think, uh, at the Trust and elsewhere, that the house was a site-specific response. Mace really um, positioned it not only to take advantage of the river, but proportionately with the woods that surrounded it at the time, and most of the trees still exist so you would really lose a lot of the important design character, I think, if you started over in a, a cornfield or something or moved it up onto a ridge. But um, the solution that they are pursuing is a hydraulic lift solution designed by Silman engineers, and uh, they've implemented hydraulic, similar hydraulic lift systems for historic buildings around the world kind of an expensive solution, but it's really probably the best. Um, you don't see it unless it's in the up position. It's completely concealed below ground. So the house rises when the water rises? Yeah. It takes 45 minutes to rise uh, eight feet above the current floor level. So, Wow, that's a big jump. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And uh, you better be sure that the flood is coming because it, you know, you have 45 minutes to get it up that high. Right. But, and it has to be tested once a year. So we joke, you know, that we're going to sell high-priced tickets to ride. <laughs> oh, uh, to oh ride yes. <laughs> oh, yes, Scott. I am there. I am ready to pay my high-priced ticket to ride yeah, this ride. That'd be a great cocktail party. <laughs> right. And you don't want to be underneath it when it comes down. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> No, it comes down very slowly. There's a, there's a pit, a basin that's not seen unless it's in the up position. And after each flood, the house stays in the up position while some people go down in that pit and clean it out. So I don't envy oh. the people who do that, but uh, yeah. it, the engineering uh, system is, is, is really... Uh, so is this in place now? 
No, we sure wish it. It's about oh. a seven million dollar project. So, oh, okay. So um, this is still a yeah. possibility. Yeah. It's, it's coming though. It's it's on the way. Yeah, Silman's probably getting close to fifty percent done with the design. So we'll be looking for. Uh, we'll be raising money soon in the next com- couple of years, I'm sure. Well, I think selling those tickets to the annual floor raising will do a right. big chunk of it right <laughs> there. Raise the money before the water <laughs> rises. Yeah. Yeah, a raise the floor party. Alex, what happened to Dr. Edith Farnsworth? Well, she had a a kind of successful afterlife, I, I, the kind we'd all wish for ourselves. The way she would have, would tell it, you know, she um, kind of got fed up with the Fox River property when the the state of Illinois wanted to change, you know, basically encroach upon her land and was about to take away some of her land and did take some away some of her land to build a bridge nearby. And so the kind of magical privacy that she and Meese had been able to create was, was going to be threatened. And she had, um, as Scott mentioned, you know, she had been in Italy as a young woman. She, um, she found herself gravitating back to Italy. She went and visited Florence a few times and spent about the last seven or eight years of her life in a kind of magnificent uh, villa, which is pictured in my book and can be found on Google, I guess, on, uh, called the Villa Tavernule in Bagno Aripoli outside of Florence. And she developed a third act. I don't know who's counting, but she became a, a respected and acknowledged translator of modern Italian poetry. And she was Eugenio Montale's first American translator shortly after Montale won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Um, so she, she traveled, in, as in Chicago, so in Italy, she, she traveled in some, some very uh, esoteric company. And um, in my book, I was sort of lucky, and luck is sort of the word for it, to find some younger Italian scholars who were interested in her and, you know, who had written about her and had, a, had sort of uh, kept her translation work alive because it's a, it's a narrow field, obviously, post-war Italian poetry, but um, she sort of constructed as, as as good a life as I think you might hope for to have for yourself. When she passed away, did she have any family? Um, well, yes. I mean, yes and no. Uh, Edith never married. Edith had no children. She had a sister, and the family who was alive when she died was her nephew, Fairbank Carpenter, whom Scott and I both know and who uh, we hope remains in excellent health. He's an intelligent man uh, in his 80s, and he, he actually had to travel to Italy and negotiate his way out of her lease and a lot of other complicated things, and he brought her body uh, back to Chicago. Hmm. Is she buried in Chicago? She's buried in the same cemetery, Graceland, where Miss Sandro is buried. Really? Huh. I'm sure that'll be the last shot of the movie, right? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a good the last production. Page of the book, I can assure you. <laughs> right. So you got to get the house raised. You got to get the movie made. Yeah. You got a real punch list here. Yeah. And the right. book is doing really well. Book's doing fine. Very happy. What's next, Scott, for the Farnsworth House in this pandemic? Can people still come out and see it? How did tours still work? What's going on out there? Right. Well, Illinois is in phase four recovery and holding. So uh, we are operating at 25%. So our tours, the flip side is, the tours are all sold out. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, they're not all. When you can only have 12 people on a tour, they sell out quickly. Right. But we also have opened the grounds, so and we have Wi-Fi in the house. So people can actually uh, do a virtual reality tour from uh, outside the house. We have exhibition guides so they can learn all about the furnishings and see the historic photographs in which the exhibition was based without going inside, you know, and being trapped for 45 minutes with a group of strangers. So, you know, we have both options. So far, everything's been great. We have no anti-maskers. Everybody's been respectful. We have benches and hiking trails and picnic tables. So it's a little bit of a park for some people, a safe park, a quiet park, but um, with this magnificent house as its centerpiece. We're also doing a number of, you know, online programs like everybody else, a lot of virtual programs. And uh, we have a series called Architees, in January, February, and March, and uh, I jokingly call them the football widows <laughs> offense because they're on Sunday afternoon oh, yeah. and they're geared mainly toward women, although there are a lot of 
women football fans as well. But um, the first one is really focused on women in mid-century design. The second one is focused on women in 20th century nature poetry. And then the third one specifically focused on sort of women leaders in the design fields in Chicago at mid-20th century. So I think all three of them will be appealing. That sounds really interesting. I mean, who put that together? Was that your idea? Yeah, we we also, of course, the National Trust has a campaign where women made history. And Farnsworth House is one of the cornerstones of that effort. And so they're really backing us. And Scott, what's the website for the house? Oh, it's FarnsworthHouse.org. Oh, easy. FarnsworthHouse.org. And Alex, yep. is there a website for the book? No, just Google Broken Glass, Alex Beam. Uh, Random House has a website. Scott put it on his website. It, it, it's around. <laughs> yeah, we have an online shop, and all of our Broken Glass books that we sell are signed by Alex. So there's definitely an advantage to buying them from the Farnsworth House. Yes, yes, before midnight tonight, please dial in to 1-800-Farnsworth. Right. Right. Only 13 copies plug. left. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been great. I really appreciate your coming on together. Thanks a lot, George. Yeah, thank it's you. always a pleasure to be with both you and Scott. Thank you so much. And now a few minutes with Frank Harmon reading from his book, Native Places. Guanajuato. I haven't been to a supermarket in six months because of the pandemic. Instead, I've shopped at an organic farm and a one-room co-op. As a result, I've learned to see the supermarket for what it is, a windowless, artificially lit, poorly laid out box where the graphics scream at me and the atmosphere is reminiscent of a visit to the DOT. I sometimes saw my friends there, But what if our supermarkets were truly social places and pleasant environments to be in? This was part of the promise of the central food market in Guanajuato, Mexico, that I visited several years ago. Rows of meat, dairy, and produce glowed in the sunshine between a lofty roof of iron and glass. A mariachi band strolled between the peppers and melons while families and strangers promenaded together savoring each other as much as the produce. I sat at an oyster bar near the center while the market surged around me. A grandmother and her family walked past. Shopkeepers stacked grapefruits in baskets so carefully the effect was aesthetic. Nearby, two women began shouting at each other. I thought they were fighting. When suddenly they hugged, I realized they were sisters. Imagine a supermarket as an atmosphere to savor. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnus Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for Modernist Houses. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino researches guests while juggling two above-average children, 12 domestic animals, an unfallen broccoli and gouda souffle, and a glass of George Clooney's tequila. Yum. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another one-named, iconic, less-is-more, God-is-in-the-details edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. 